Okay, I'm going to try and make this video again. This is a shout out to a guy named Ben Joyner. He sent me his video this morning and I didn't know about him before. And I'm going to play his video and comment on it. I suggest you subscribe to him because he's what I would call a thinking Christian. I have no idea what his beliefs are, but that doesn't matter. The whole goal of the spiritual life is to think out Bible. That's what this guy is going to do in his video, as we're going to see. Here, the topic is on why does God send people to hell. Okay? So, that's the first thing. And then the second thing that recommends him is that in his video description, he provides a gist of his video here which is really important. Plus, he provides links where you can compare different points of view to his own. Alright? And this apparently is the theme of his channel. I try to remove the confusion surrounding Christ at new videos every Monday and Friday. So I would suggest that you subscribe to him because he's a thinking Christian. Whether we agree with each other or not is beside the point. We are the fruit, not what we do. And the way you become the fruit of Christ is to learn the thinking of Christ, which is the Bible, 1 Corinthians 2.16, and play with it. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. It matters if you're playing with the doctrine and learning it. You will eventually get right on the doctrines, but you will never get right on the doctrines if you don't think them out. In other words, the King James only people correctly state the gospel, but they are always parroting what somebody else said. They can't read the Bible themselves. Okay? They really can't. This guy is trying to think through Scripture. And that's what you need to do as a Christian. This is the Christian way of life, is to learn and live on Bible. Okay? That's what he's doing. So let's go into what he says here. Please share the information provided in this video. Always remember that a crucial part of removing a person's confusion is understanding his or her unique source of it. Now, when he says that, what he's trying to say is that understand where the person is coming from. Look at the backstory. Look at the background. You can't just get a snippet and know what a person is thinking, what they're trying to say. The same thing is especially true of Bible. You don't just cherry pick verses. You look at the verses, you look at the context, you compare it to other verses. The first thing you want to do with any Bible book is find out what the author himself is trying to say, where the author is coming from, which means you have to read the whole book to understand any particular verse in that book. Okay, and then you have to compare a pan Bible, which is what this guy's going to start to do. All right, what is hell? Uh, you've heard of that terrible burning place that... Christians talk about I'm a Christian, so I actually believe in the terrible bargain place. Notice how he's being upfront, blunt, honest, and you can tell by his eyes that he's thinking while he talks. He's not trying to preach. Um, that's what the Bible has to say instead of what Christians have to say. See, he's going by the right standard. What does the Bible say? Not what do I think. But what does the Bible say? It's not what Ben thinks. It's what the Bible says. It's not what Brainout thinks. It's what the Bible says. And the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians, first chapter, you know, starting in the seventh verse, we won't go to the second half of the seventh verse, it says, When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven and with his mighty angels in flaming fire, Inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer punishment, the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed. Because our testimony to you was believed. Now eternal destruction. There's a lot of different ways to picture it, but the idea is that it's bad. Um, and it talks about 
the eternal destruction is being away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But let's look at the next question. Why does the Bible refer to heaven as for righteous and hell as for unrighteous? Just so that you know, when he's <clears throat> saying next question, he's looking at this. He's responding to somebody else's set of questions about why hell. And Ephritro, Ephretro, this dilemma is what he's basically arguing around. That's a fair question. Um, typically what people think is that good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. That's not really what the Bible says. So if you're going to go by the Bible, then that's not really what you go by. So you look at Romans 10.4, also written by Paul to another Greco-Roman city. This is to Rome itself. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So, you know, he's gone through this long issue of saying that, you know, the rules of right and wrong have been ended as a, as a system of judging people. Um, Christ is the end of the law. It's not about good people going to heaven and bad people going to hell. He says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, this is 10-9, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And then we look at Romans 3, 21-24, and we get a little bit better explanation as he was building up to the other verses. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith. It's okay. So he's saying not through being a good person and good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. He's saying you have righteousness through faith, through just believing in something. Faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So the Christian idea is that everyone is a sinner and that hell is for bad people, but heaven is also for bad people. Everyone, everywhere is bad, and some go to heaven and some go to hell, but the distinction between who goes to heaven and hell is not who deserves it or who is a better person. It is not a great accomplishment to make it to heaven. You're justified, you're made righteous before God by a gift. It is a gift, and through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And the essential idea is that we deserve punishment, as the earlier early verses talked about. Christ became a man and underwent that punishment and was punished in our place. And as long as we receive that gift through faith, then we won't be punished. Uh, we will be considered righteous. Now, let's look back at the notes. Can a person get out of hell? Well, I think that was covered in the Second Thessalonians verse. Like it's it's forever. Okay, now here <clears throat> I have to sort of correct him a little bit. Um, he's talking about this passage here, and he's saying that based on this passage, specifically verse nine, is what he's thinking of. That hell lasts forever, and therefore everybody's forced to stay there. The verse actually in Greek does not say that everybody has to stay there. All it says is that the punishment, it's not even called punishment, the Greek word is cholephron, the actual word in the, in the verse in 2 Thessalonians 1.9, ionion, and that literally means ruin, destruction for the ages. It's talking about a period of time. It's not talking about a door closing and you're stuck. Okay. Second Peter 3 9 supports the idea that God is never willing that anybody in hell stay there. It's got two Greek words, ook and me. Ook denies the fact, me denies the idea. So you should translate Second Peter 3 9. God is never willing that any should perish. Now there's your key right there. Hell lasts forever because you can still get out. The problem is that people don't want to get out. So it keeps on going. Ionion in 
2 Thessalonians 1 9 is saying for ages and it is a metaphor for forever but it's talking about the length of time it's not talking about being locked in there that's the distinction you always have to be real precise when you're analyzing scripture so it's holethron which means destruction or ruin the actual Greek word um, holethron means, I'm quoting from BDAG now, Bauer Danker Lexicon, a state of destruction, ruin, death, act of destruction, okay? The idea that you're in, it's like Dresden being bombed, all right? But when you're in a state of destruction, that doesn't mean you can't get out. That just means where you are. So let's go back to what he's saying now. So this, but this does raise the issue of, you know, if God's so loving and what's his, you know, willing to go through all this trouble of his son dying for our sins, uh, why does he ever send, you know, why do people even go to hell at all? You know, why does God even do that? You know, and George Carlin makes a joke about an invisible man who lives in the sky, who has a list of ten things. He doesn't want you to do the Ten Commandments, you know, God. And he's saying, if you do one of those ten things and he's got a hot place where he's going to burn you up forever, but... He also needs your money, so get out your wallets, you know, <laughs> because we do pass the altar play in church. And that's certainly, you can understand exactly where he's coming from, like, doesn't it look that way? And the responses that Christians give, Christians give are, are pretty bad on this issue. The typical response, let's look at that, uh, calling God loving but also just. So, you know, the issue is, like, why would a loving God send people to hell in the first place? Why would a Jesus need to die in the first place? Why doesn't God just forgive everyone without people even asking? Like, God's such a loving God. And, in fact, First John, I think, 4 says that God is love. So why would a loving God send people to hell? And so what Christians say is something uh, pretty stupid. Um, I don't want to say they are stupid, but... If you look down at it, it's a terrible idea. Um, calling God loving but also just. The problem with that is that it's not true to the Bible. It's true to what Christians want to say about God. And the problem is that the Bible has a much loftier, better thought out concept of God than the ones we make up to answer some question. The biblical God is love. So if he is love, he can't, there is no but also nothing. He can't be but also holy or just. Like, he is love. That's what he is. So you can't say that, that what that means is that God equals love. So if God, you know, is loving, then like he could be loving some of the time and then he could be just some of the other time. He can be holy on Thursday and loving on Friday, you know, something like that. But, if God is love, if that is equated to what he is, if he is, you know, the personification of love, then he can never not be loving. There, there's no absence of love in anything he does, even his justice, even his holiness is a love holiness. There, there is no separation of the two. So, yeah, that's a terrible answer. Um, Euphithro okay, before he gets into Euphithro's dilemma, did you hear how he analyzed that? He's extrapolating from scripture and reasoning it out. He's learning and living on Bible, in this case, to understand how the attributes of God interconnect and work. Now, in this guy, in just a few minutes you just heard now, he did a better job of analyzing the character of God than almost all of the theologians who are regarded as famous in history. He's saying if God is love, then all of his other attributes are part and parcel of that love. Now this has been a debate that theologians have undergone assiduously for 2,000 years, especially the Calvinists. And this guy said in a few minutes what they have spent thousands of pages trying to analyze. So this guy's got his head together better than them. And you'll notice, he doesn't have a lot of initials after his name. I wouldn't be surprised if this guy, he probably uses 1 John 1, 9 a lot. Because his thought pattern is right there. I mean, it's really kind of funny because 
he talks kind of the way my pastor did, which is kind of a surprise. Now, now he's covering the, the topic. He's answering something he's seeing on screen called Ephithro's Dilemma. All right, so now he's reading from concepts or questions that are in the dilemma, just so that you know he's shifting topics now. Is something we need to talk about. And you can throw the dilemma. We won't go into too much about it, but fundamentally the question is, uh, does God command us to be good because, you know, where do these commands come from? Did he just make them up? Or does he command it because it's right? So is it, or here's the way you put it, is it right because he commands it, or does he command it because it's right? Now, if you say it's right because he commands it, then he could have made anything right, and it, the very purpose of our lives, which would be goodness over evil, the meaning of existence, you know, would be something that was created purposelessly by the roll of a dice. You know, God could have made anything. You know? And so... It's logically contradictory for God for it to be good because God commanded it because that would mean that everything is good or anything could be good and there's good itself is 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 purposeless purpose is purposeless but if God you know if it's if He commands it because it's good then He's not really God so that's also logically contradictory God can't make it you know He can't command it because it's good because that means there's some authority that He's serving the response to the dilemma is that there's a third option you know so. Evil is not above God, and it's not, I mean, uh, morality and rules and commands are not above God, they're not below God, but they are God. That God is morality. That And that would make perfect sense, because morality has to apply to beings, persons. It does not apply to rocks and its and what's and things and this and that. You know, it, it only applies to someone's. Um, it is not about the way things are, it's about the way things ought to be. See how well he analyzed that? I wouldn't use the word morality, but he's talking in terms of uh, Ephethro's dilemma. So he's using the term morality. God is love. If God is love, then God is good. If God is good, then everything God decrees will be good because God is good. In other words, the cause of the goodness is God himself, not something above God or something below God. It's intrinsic to God. And he's calling that intrinsic quality morality, but really it would be love. And you can prove that because the Lord loves justice is uh, in Psalm 89, 14 through 15. And then the Lord puts the truth above his own person. That's in Psalm 138, 2 at the last clause. Now, if we understand that, then let's look at the next question. What is God really? Okay, well, we obviously don't know all that God is, but what can we know? Just because we don't know everything doesn't mean we can't know something. Um, well, what we've discovered before is that if God exists, he would have to be the source of all goodness. He would have to be goodness itself. So the fundamental grounding of all goodness, okay, source of all goodness, okay? Well, we can deduce from that, therefore, he loves perfectly, right? Because if love is good, then his love is perfectly good. He's, if he's the source of all goodness, then he is perfectly loving at all times. All right? Therefore, he would let you have what you want. You know, to some degree, if you really want something, he's going to, you know, he's going to let you have it. I mean, he wouldn't let you do whatever, but love dictates that God would care about our choices and our wishes that we make. Um... What is sin really? Next question. Well, it's a request to have goodness out of your life, right? I mean, that makes sense. Sin is being bad, doing evil. It's just a Christian word for that. But ultimately, being bad is a request to have goodness out of your life. Well, we can deduce from that. And therefore, this request, being bad, is a request to have God out of your life. I don't know what went wrong with my machine right now. It's in the system hang. If God is goodness. Okay. Let me replay that. Probably some stupid Microsoft update interrupted. Let's play this again. What is sin really? Next question. Well, it's a request to have goodness out of your life, right? 
And that makes sense. Sin is being bad, doing evil. It's just a Christian word for that. But ultimately, being bad is a request to have goodness out of your life. Well, we can deduce from that. And therefore, this request, being bad, is a request to have God out of your life. If God is goodness. Okay, so the next question is, what is it like to have the source of all goodness out of your life? Okay, if, this, if, if God grants that request, then we, that doesn't, that sounds like hell to me, you know, to have the source of all goodness, that nothing good. Okay, did you see how he reasoned that out? That you're requesting God to not be part of your life. Okay, when a Christian sins, he's basically electing to be in a state of sin, to live on his own power, rather than on God's power. That's why I keep harping on using 1 John 1, 9. Because if I sin, when I sin, I am electing the sin life rather than God's life. Okay, that's as a Christian. As an unbeliever, if I never believe in Jesus Christ paying for my sins, I'm electing no God. I'm electing that to never have a relationship with God. And so when he said that sounds like hell to me, yeah, of course it would be. If God's supposed to stand off and not be a part of my life, then my life is hell. And the trouble with the with people who don't believe in God is they don't realize the difference between the hell that they're living and the heaven they could be living right down here on earth. Everything bad. Or I got a text. But. See, everything bad is what I'm electing if I'm electing to never believe in Christ. Everything bad is what I'm electing when, as a Christian, I, I choose to sin, and I refuse to use 1 John 1, 9 to get back in fellowship with God. That's, that's hell, you know? See, that's what hell is. So when, as a Christian, when I sin, I'm electing hell for my life. So God grants my request, like he, he putting things in his words. God is granting my request. I'm choosing sin instead. I'm choosing the hell of this life instead to be away from him. And so I get that. When I use 1 John 1, 9, I'm electing to be with him instead. And so I get that. The unbeliever is electing to never believe in Christ, to have a lifestyle that's totally apart from God. So that's what God grants. A loving God would grant what you want. That's his point. And he makes it well. Um, next question, how important are our choices to God? And this is the thing. Uh, it would seem pretty important, right? I mean, God loves us, and therefore what we do matters to him, does it not? Yeah. If he is the source of all goodness, then he's loving, because love is obviously good. So therefore, our choices have weight and significance to God. They are important to Him. Okay, so now, the next question is, what is the difference between forgiveness and saying, I don't care what you do? I'd say that again. What is the difference between forgiving someone and saying, I don't care what you do? How are those two things different? Well, if you say... I don't care what you do, you're saying your choices don't matter to me. But forgiveness is saying, yes, you did wrong, and yes, it matters. But I'm not going to, you know, I still love you, and I'm, I want to help you somehow. So the key is, is that for Jesus Christ to come and die for our sins is the only logical possible way to forgive human beings. If God considers the choices of human beings to be significant and important. And in fact, if he loves us, therefore he must consider our choices to matter and be significant and have weight and have consequences. To mean something. So when you know if God just you know forgives us and just says, I you know, I don't care what choices they made in their lives, whatever, send them to heaven, then he's saying what you do with your life does it matter at all to me? But if he sends us to hell, that means what we do with our lives, our choices, matter a great deal to him. 
that our lives have significance, that our choices have meaning and importance, and that we're not just someone who, you know, says and this and screams and kicks, but, you know, he doesn't care. He just puts us in the, in the pen. And if he sends his own son to die for our sins, then that's a very strong picture of how important our choices and our actions are to him. So therefore, really, hell and Christ's death on the cross is the strongest picture of a God of love you can possibly ha have. And that's the irony is that Christians have this, he's loving, but he's also just. And there, it's so dumb. Did you see how he did that? If God loves you, then he cares about what you think. He cares about what you do. Since he's a parent, because he makes each soul at birth, Genesis 2-7, the reason you're not evolved is because God directly created your soul and imputed it to the exiting body at birth. So he cares about you, or he wouldn't have made you in the first place. All right, if he cares about you and he cares about your decisions, A, he's going to give you what you want, but B, you're going to bear the consequences of what you want, because as a parent, he wants to train you in the free effects of your own decisions. That's a loving God, and he paid for the fact that you can be free by sending Christ to the cross. So all you have to do is believe to be saved. So it's not like he didn't take responsibility for the freedom he put in you. But see, you're going to be condemned to hell if you choose not to have a relationship with God because you're choosing something and you should get the free effects of your choice. Now, where I differ with this guy is, first of all, based on 2 Thessalonians 1.9, it does not say that people who go to hell are forced to stay there. It just says that it lasts forever. So that doesn't mean that everybody in it is going to be forever in it. The reason I say that is 2 Peter 3.9, God is never, ever willing that anyone should perish. So the second reason why a loving God would send you to hell is that in hell you still have the chance to believe in Jesus Christ because he paid for the sins of the whole world, 1 John 2. So since you're already paid for, there's no reason to obliterate you. There's no reason to deny you the abil ability to go to heaven ever. But if you don't want God, if that's your request, God grants your request, you get to have the free consequences of your request, and hell is a place where, as it were, God's Benefic beneficent presence is not because you elected a relationship apart from God so that's what you get because it's and it's so unbiblical and the interesting thing is that now what he's saying here that's unbiblical is the Christian saying that God is love but also just as if just was the opposite of love that is not true the Lord loves justice Psalm 89 14 and 15 Okay, Christ demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died as a substitute for us, meaning that the justice of God, being loved by the love of God, sent Christ to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. So since the penalty is paid, all we have to do is believe it. If we refuse to believe it, then we are electing a life that is apart from God, apart from his justice, apart from Christ's payment. And that's why we go to hell. It's the only reason why we go to hell. John 69, concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Not concerning any other sins you commit. The biblical idea is rather unique among world religions, rather incredible. So what is the difference between forgiveness and saying, I don't care what you do? That is the thing to ponder about and to ask yourself, and for all of us to ask, that is it. When it gets to the idea of what Christians believe, you know, and uh, don't make up ideas about God. Go, you know, go by what the Bible says. And uh, so in closing, I hope... Okay, before he gets to his closing... Did you notice what he said? Go by what the Bible says, not by what you think. If God exists, and if he's the God of the Bible, the way to know what the God of the Bible says is through the Bible. So if you're an atheist and you don't believe in God, fine. 
But if you are interested to know what the God of the Bible is like, you have to read the Bible to know. You have to go by what it says. And then you can reject it or accept it as you choose. But the standard of the God of the Bible is the Bible. That's why we have one. We don't have dreams and visions. We have it in writing. The dreams and visions thing and God flying a blimp over the sky, manifesting himself physically, was a royal problem in the Old Testament. The spiritual life is an invisible life because it's supposed to be about an intimate relationship between God and you. If you want to reject that, that's your free right. But if you reject it, and you never once believe Christ paid for your sins, you go to hell. Because God is loving, you will continually have the opportunity to get out. But the problem is, the last half of Luke 16, the problem is that once you're in hell, you love shaking your fist at God. Go read the last half of Luke 16 to find out the attitude of the typical person in hell. They love shaking their fists. They love trying to manipulate people. They love being self-righteous. That's the danger you run into if you never once believe Christ paid for your sins, is that you get addicted to shaking your fist at God. And therefore, you won't want to get out of hell. Hope you found this video informative and enjoyable. New videos every Monday and Friday. Thank you for your time. Yes, I found this video very informative and enjoyable and refreshing. And thank you, Ben Joyner, for sending it to me. Peace out.